Today, we're going to talk about not one, but two mini PCs from Geekum, the left one having an Intel chip and the right one having an AMD. Now, they have a very similar spec otherwise, both having 32 gigs of RAM and two terabytes of storage in this case, but I wanted to do this video to kind of showcase the differences between both models to each other, what they're capable of, and also help you understand a little bit more from Geekum. What's up everyone, it's Cho from Gadgetry Tech, and yes, I know this video is very different than the stuff I normally cover. And for those of you new to the channel, I usually focus on audio, both in high-end and in gaming, along with some peripherals along the way. I took this on because I personally wanted to learn about mini PCs more, and for my use cases, I've been needing and wanting to get a second PC for streaming and content creation um, that was compact enough to fit on my desk so I can test very specific use cases which I will cover. Now, Geekum timed it right. They have two great specs here. This is a high-end AMD build and a high-end Intel. I didn't want to talk about pricing because they seem to go up and down a bit, and Geekum does some crazy specials where these can get uh, absurdly cheap for the performance you're getting. So if that sways your opinion, maybe check out some deals. So on that note, Geekum did send this to me for review. I have no monetary exchange. I will not be participating in the affiliate program. I don't believe in doing any of that stuff because I don't make content to make money. I actually make the content because I'm passionate about it. Luckily, I have a day job so I can kind of run the channel how I want. With that being said, this review will be very unbiased. I'm going to talk about specs. We're going to show a lot of close-ups, some benchmarks and some real world use cases that I think might sway you in either direction. Now, both of these have a similar PCB layout inside, but the XT13 Pro is much easier to access. You have these four exposed screws, whereas this one I had to remove the rubber feet on the A8. Once you remove it, I'm gonna be careful here because there's a little antenna on the A8. Then I had to remove additional screws inside. These are for the base amount, but you can see the general layout of the PCB is the same. Now the left side, you have your two RAM slots, which are not soldered, so you can quickly change that out. And then because I had a two terabyte NVMe configuration, these both have the same uh, Acer and uh, 7000 NVMe. Now the Intel system has a 2242 NVMe slot for a secondary slot, so you can add additional storage. So if you're looking for more than two terabytes, the Intel base one can easily go to three. Obviously you can make these higher than two terabytes if you swap the drive out yourself, but I just want to show you the layout. The rest of the PCB is basically identical, but what's funny is on the AMD system, you have the exposed SD card reader on the side here. And I've funny enough, on the Intel system, you also have an SD card reader, but it's blocked off by this chassis. This is actually the side that goes over the SD card reader, and it gives you a Kensington lock. And even the website says SD card reader, but it points to the Kensington lock. So I'm not sure if that was a defect or not, if you're really crafty, maybe you can do something with uh, modifying the chassis here. I don't recommend doing something that will void your warranty, but that's something to consider. So if you really need to use an SD card reader, maybe just buy an external if you got the XT13 Pro. I think it's pretty safe to say that having an AMD GPU is going to perform a lot better than Intel. And in most cases, it did. Now, there were a couple weird things in between where... Sometimes a game would have these like micro stutters and the Intel didn't have the same micro stutter, but it was performing at a lower quality and lower frame rate anyway. The other thing I noticed with Intel was more on the driver side and, and this was more uh, visible in games like Call of Duty, both multiplayer and Warzone, where the map just wasn't rendering right. I don't think someone's gonna buy an Intel mini PC with no GPU with the hopes of running a AAA first person shooter, battle royale or not. So, but I did test that and there were definitely some GPU artifacts, which is kind of common when you look at, you know, Intel graphics drivers for certain games. That issue is not apparent on AMD, which provided a much more normal gaming experience. Now, in addition to AMD rightly having more frames per second on gaming, there were a couple weird things I noticed. So you really have to still stay with conservative resource utilization on the AMD chip. Part of this is because even though you can maintain 50 plus uh, frames per second, the GPU time and lag still suffered just a little bit compared to a much more powerful system. I use a, a actual desktop version of the 13900K on my desktop with the RTX 4090. So I'm going from a very high performing system to a mini PC and I, was, I wasn't expecting these to come close to that in graphics performance, which is fine. But even when I dialed the graphics back to maintain 50 plus frames per second, I noticed it just wasn't as competitive. If you are a more a skilled player and those micro adjustments and really fast twitch responses are important to you. 
I don't think an integrated GPU is going to quite give you that. So purely on the competitive side, if you're looking for that, I would still go with a larger, more powerful machine. It's not to say it wasn't usable, though. I was actually surprised at how playable it was. It's pretty incredible that such a small computer can maintain that level of fidelity and graphics performance. And even if you weren't playing FPS games, which this can do, even if you weren't, it was still good enough. You don't really notice that input lag stuff as much, and then you're still benefited by the uh, increased fidelity and graphics performance. I don't think everyone's gonna buy a mini PC like this with hopes of maintaining just insane performance for first-person shooters. If you're a competitive player, chances are you're looking for a bigger rig anyway. But for casual players, these both can do a good enough job. I was impressed by certain things the Intel machine was doing, and even when you use Intel's image scaling, if I didn't have those rendering issues, the frame rates were still playable. So it was an interesting thing. I think it's a matter of which games you play, but overall, to be safe, if you are planning on using this for a lot of games, I would still lean towards the AMD system. All right, so let's take a look at some benchmarks, and we're going to start with Pi Compute, which does favor Intel here. Now, just to kind of explain the way these charts work, the blue represents Intel and red represents AMD. And in this particular chart, the bottom x-axis is seconds. So naturally, if it finishes in less time, that is a preferred result. And this does favor Intel typically. So if you look at Pi Fast, Super Pi and Pi Prime. Intel does come out ahead here. It just seems to favor that architecture. Y Cruncher has a different result because that one is actually multi-threaded and it takes advantage of the higher core count on the AMD Ryzen 9. The bottom measurement is GPU Pi, which is of course a GPU based measurement and AMD performs well here. There's nothing really to compare it to because the Intel 13900H does not have a double precision compute capability on the graphics cards, so we weren't able to run this test. I just wanted to keep this up for visibility. Moving over to Cinebench, I benchmarked version 15, 20, and 23, and on the single threaded benchmarks, Intel and AMD are fairly close, although the edge does slightly go to AMD. The lead is extended, however, when we look at multi-threaded, and naturally, the higher the score here, the better, so there is a pretty big lead, especially on version 20 and 23 when you look at multi-threading. Moving on to content creation, I used Puget Bench to benchmark both Premiere Pro and Photoshop, and it's no surprise AMD came ahead here. AMD has an advantage here both in CPU and GPU, partly because the AMD can sustain higher core clocks for longer periods of time, and the GPU, which is often leveraged with certain effects in both Premiere Pro and Photoshop, takes advantage of Ryzen 9's Radeon graphics card, so I did expect higher results here, and this is what it is. Looking into Premiere Pro further, a few things stand out. Now, certain GPU effects don't really have a difference regardless of which GPU you use. In fact, the Gaussian blur does perform better on Intel, and that's a pretty common effect. Most of the other effects do favor AMD, but only slightly, with some of the more complex ones really stretching their legs on the AMD side. AMD really shines on the encoding performance, so if you have large project files and you're rendering a lot, you can save as much as half the amount of time just by switching to AMD compared to the 13900, so that's not a small difference. On Photoshop, AMD does still have an edge, but the differences become more negligible, and in real-world use cases, a lot of these effects, you won't have a perceivable difference between both processors. Now, both of these are great for Photoshop. They perform extremely well. It's only on the most complex tasks that you'll start to see a little bit more of the edge on AMD, but again, nothing really bad here. Focusing more on GPU-specific benchmarks, it's no surprise that AMD pulls ahead here. It's just a more capable GPU that runs at higher clocks, so it's naturally going to outperform Intel. Intel is improving, though, so some of these are still very much playable, and depending on the game, you'll enjoy it just as much. It's just when the games become more demanding and you need as much power as you can get, the AMD is going to have the edge. I also use 3D Mark to run some benchmarks for both GPU and CPU. So the CPU tests simulate a game load and we can cap it on thread count because some game engines still don't use all threads. Some older games are stuck with one thread, maybe four, etc. So on the single thread side, Intel and AMD are neck and neck. There's a very slight edge to AMD here, but that's so minimal it won't really make a difference in gaming. As you step up into four threads, AMD starts to increase its lead a little bit further, and that lead gets much greater if you uncork it and you run the maximum amount of threads the CPU is capable of. AMD is just a slightly more powerful chip, mainly because it's able to sustain higher frequencies over long periods of time. Now on the graphics card side, we have Firestrike running DirectX 11, and Intel, even though it does get beaten by AMD here, that is still a pretty good score for an integrated GPU 
on an Intel chip, they've definitely made improvements. Both Time Spy and Steel Nomad, even the light version, do push the GPU a bit harder, and that's where the raw power of AMD starts to shine a little bit, so you can see a much bigger score difference here. Now, I ran CPU-Z for the benchmark, but also the stress test, and I started noticing some things with the way the CPUs perform. So I used a watt meter and measured power at the wall on each machine, and I ran the stress test over time. Now I have four columns of values. The zero represents the moment I hit stress test, what was the score and what was the power consumption at the outlet. One minute later is the next value and this is the power consumption and performance for both CPUs. Then we go to two minutes and then three minutes. I mentioned AMD having a higher sustained frequency response and that translates to a couple things here. So the first number, Intel does have the edge on the initial benchmark of CPU-Z. You can see the score of 7350 versus 7126. The initial power spike from the stress test puts Intel at 87 watts at the outlet and AMD pulled 81.5. That does trickle down rather quickly and if we look at one minute in, now the AMD takes the lead over Intel with a multi-threaded score of 6631 and 6122 for Intel. Power consumption does decrease for both, but AMD starts to consume more power here, again because it's sustaining higher clocks. So it pulls 64 watts at the outlet, whereas Intel trickles all the way down to 51.9. Now two minutes from initial time after I click stress test, the AMD is sustaining a pretty comparable score, dropping only to 6581, but Intel drops all the way down to 5752. At the three minute mark, AMD is rock solid here, maintaining the exact same score, Intel dropping down to 5636. With comparable power consumption on both, the Intel only going up slightly because again, the fan is spinning just a little bit higher to maintain that temperature. Now, just to put it in perspective, this is the raw result of Firestrike on the Intel C CPU, and the purple line represents the frequency of the processor, and you can see a lot of spikes going up and down. Part of this has to do with the turbo boost, but it is dropping quite significantly in certain loads, and this is why you're seeing those multi-threaded tasks having a lower score compared to AMD over time. You can tweak the results slightly. If you use the Intel tuner, you can extend the turbo boost for longer periods of time, which will increase power consumption and fan noise, so keep that in mind. I ran everything in the default setting because I felt that was the most fair way to represent both out of the box. To put it in perspective, if you look at the Ryzen 9 CPU clock, it maintains a much more narrow window, also at a higher frequency, and this is why you're seeing the multi-threaded task take the lead here on AMD. Again, this is how it came out of the box, and this is also why it runs a little bit noisier on the fan. Now this was an interesting result because they both use the same Acer N7000 two terabyte NVMe SSD. Now the memory controller on Intel performed much better than AMD, in some cases 50% faster on certain benchmarks. It ended up resulting in much faster game load times. So even though AMD does play at a higher frame rate, if you go in and out of games a lot or you're constantly writing media, the Intel system does have a better memory controller and it does perform better on storage. Now admittedly, the big reason why I wanted a mini PC is because I occasionally do live streaming and I wanted to completely isolate my rig from handling the streaming load. So any of these could technically work, but there are some unique situations here where in this case, this is where I would prefer the Intel. I started with a workload where I recorded two 4K videos only in 1080p at six megabits per second. My goal was to somewhat replicate similar performance to what you'd be able to upload to Twitch. So if you're a content creator and you're looking to live stream, a mini PC is a high consideration to use for that. That is the biggest reason why I did this video. I noticed two things. The Intel system was able to record the content a little bit quieter. The fan noise didn't ramp up as much. And because this is using QuickSync, which is Intel's uh, video encoder, it also performed a little bit better from a clarity standpoint. If you pixel peep and zoom in to a lower resolution, low bitrate content, the Intel system still provided a better quality picture. So if you are looking to stream, especially to Twitch or anywhere where you're constrained by bitrate, the Intel has a clear edge here. Not only is it quieter, so you don't have to worry about fan noise as much, but at the same bit rate, I seem to have gotten better picture quality. It gets confusing though, because this still has a 3D encoder. Now you can use this for streaming and it'll still work fine for Twitch. It just may not look as good. If that's okay with you, then there are other benefits here. This won't be as much of a difference if you are encoding, let's say to YouTube, and you can write at 40 megabits per second on a stream. It's gonna be a very little difference, especially when you're starting to get into 4K capture. Let's say you use the Elgato 
capture card, which is using USB. You can plug it into either of these and still capture excellent picture quality regardless of the unit you use. Where Intel struggled big time is if I was playing a game on the Intel system and also trying to capture that game footage using QuickSync. Obviously, if we're capturing through software, the performance is going to be uh, more poor, but in this case, the QuickSync encoder should offload all of those requirements from the CPU to maintain good quality encoding regardless of the load. That wasn't the case here. I actually got very choppy performance. It's basically unusable. So if you're looking for one box to play and capture at the same time, for my use cases, the AMD did a better job there. So if you're planning on getting one of these to capture streaming from your other PC because you want to offload that, the Intel is an easy recommend here. Not only does it run more quietly, which again helps for your mic, but it also produces better picture quality at the same bit rate. You have unique situations where this is more of an all-in-one system, and if you're at higher bit rates, that difference may not matter as much. I've had these for over a month now, and I've been using them a lot off and on. I set up a second desk where I connected these to two Sony 27-inch 4K monitors, and they worked well. I never had any crashes, which is excellent, and they didn't do anything so bad where it became like a real usability issue. I did have one time where I booted the AMD system, and it had a GPU driver error, like a crash, pretty common for AMD drivers, unfortunately. They've gotten so much better over time, but that was a one-time thing and everything still worked. I didn't have to reboot to still use the GPU. It was kind of like an odd bug. The other thing I noticed, and this is weird, but I, I never would have known this had I not set it up this way. These like preferred whatever the first monitor was on the first port of whatever they were connected to. If I tried switching the HDMI cable, even though the monitors were identical, I just switch them the other monitor wouldn't initialize. It's almost like it assigned a profile to itself of what it expected for a monitor. I tried this a few times and eventually I got the AMD one to work on both monitors by changing it instead of HDMI one, I plugged it into HDMI two and then the monitor, init monitor initialized. So some weird things there. If you're having uh, issues with a monitor initializing when you connect either of these, maybe try a different port or just power cycle it, unplug it, and plug it in a couple times. Eventually I got them to work no problem, but it was an interesting bug that I hadn't run into before. Another benefit of a mini PC is the vase mount. So you, it's not like these have to sit on the desk. And the vase mount gives you a few options. You can mount it to the back of a monitor if the vase bracket is there, so you can just bolt it in. That's really nice because it cleans up your desk. However, just keep in mind the orientation of it because it's expelling all of the hot air out of the back of the unit, so maybe position it so it's uh, breathable and it can vent that correctly. But this is nice because if you just got a nice monitor for yourself or for a kid, for example, maybe the kid wants to use this for homework, playing Roblox or Minecraft, both of these played that absolutely fine. I had no issues there. So this is a much cleaner approach than having a laptop sitting on your desk and then plugged into the monitor. So that was another benefit. Now I like the VESA mounts because I have the Corsair platform desk and I'm not gonna be mounting this to the back of my screen. I'm using the VESA mount. However, that bracket allows me to mount it in a lot of other configurations on the back of my platform desk. So I can now have a mini PC connected there. I can have a remote monitor if I wanted to. And now I have the ability to have a streaming setup with a very small footprint on my desk. Now, hopefully after watching this, if you've seriously been considering a mini PC, I hope this helped you kind of weigh the pros and cons of both platform types. You don't have to buy Geekum. I want to give a huge thanks to them for being patient with this. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, these worked incredibly well. I obviously haven't used every mini PC out there, so I don't know how these will stack up to competitors, but for the price, these performed well for me. Now for my personal use case for how I want to use it for streaming and content creation, I am going to still use the Intel version, even though the AMD gave me better performance for the money by far. I like the fact that this one's a little bit quieter, that's important to me, and I like using QuickSync for streaming. It does a better job for my particular use case, which I think is a worthy option to consider if you are serious about streaming. Don't feel like you have to buy another giant GPU or, or tower, I should say, to handle those loads. You can go with a mini PC and get arguably the same results. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you learned a little bit more about these mini PCs today. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'd love to see you at the next video where we will resume our scheduled programming and get back into audio. So thanks so much for the support and I'll see you next time. Bye.